going to be a few different places. Really, if you want to find Matthew or get in the area of Matthew, maybe you've got a piece of paper or something you can stick in there. We're going to be back in the later chapters of Matthew around chapter 20, 21, 22. Uh, but for now, First Peter chapter number 3, and uh, look at with me at verse number 14. And if you're physically able, we'll stand and we'll read just uh, three verses uh, to use as our uh, starting point tonight. And we're continuing uh, the, the first thought of our series on uh, questions. And uh, we just entitled it simply Asking for a Friend. And if you have a question, we encourage you. Some of you have given questions already. I'm thankful for that. I do have another box. Somebody stole my other box, but I do have a new box. Um, don't steal my next box. Um, but if you uh, have a question, you want to take one of our connection cards. It's not just for visitors. You can take that, write it on the back. Uh, where it says other information or prayer requests, just write your question on there. You can drop that in there. You don't have to sign your name, and we'll go through some of those in the coming weeks. All right. First Peter 3, look at verse number 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Again, we'll ask the Lord for his help just with the message tonight. Lord, we've prayed and we're grateful for your answers as you're working uh, even in ways we don't know. Help us tonight to understand what you're saying here. And may we be a strong testimony. We ask it again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. So we started this a couple of weeks ago. We were um, not rudely interrupted, but we had a week of vacation Bible school last week. And again, I'm thankful for everyone that worked and, and uh, had a, a good week uh, last week. So thank you. But we are starting this series talking about uh, the idea of apologetics or uh, really don't let that word scare you. It's just a giving a reasoned response for why I believe a certain way or, or justification for something. I'm, I'm reasoning out. I'm thinking through why it is that I believe in this, whatever this might be. That's really what apologetics is. Um, one, one definition that I found, and I don't, I don't really like it necessarily, just, and I'll, I'll explain it here in just a second, but the definition was speaking in defense. And the idea is, okay, I, I, I am a Christian and I'm speaking in defense of Christianity or speaking in defense of God, but in any other thing, that's fine and that definition might be great, but uh, I don't have to defend God. <laughs> he, he, he needs no defense. I don't have to defend the Bible. It needs no defense. It is what it is. It is the very Word of God. It is truth. And God is the creator of this universe. It's not like, well, His little creation is going to... He's going to defend, you know, His creator. That is... I'm incapable of doing that. God can defend Himself. I might look at apologetics as, de again, defending or, or reasoning out my, my uh, uh, belief in why do I believe that there is a God, All right? And so that's kind of maybe the, the avenue that I might take with that. But just have that definition in mind as we go through some of these things. And uh, that's really the idea is I want you to ask questions that... Uh, you might be asked at your workplace, you know, around the water cooler. Does anybody still have water coolers anymore? I mean, that's just kind of an old phrase. Um, but it, maybe uh, you've got somebody in your family that's asking you questions. You don't maybe know how to best answer that. Or, you know, you may have heard it preached a certain way, and then you've heard it preached a different way. Well, what does the Bible really, what, what does it mean, you know, about, uh, about this certain subject? And so if you have any of those, please, again, you can email, you can ask me, write, you know, face-to-face, -face and I'll write it down. You can uh, write it down and, and submit a card, any way that you want to get that to me. I'd appreciate that very much. Thank you, those of you that already have done that. But uh, apologetics, why do we believe what we believe and can we reason out we're not trying to we're not doing this to win an argument all right we're not doing this to say well i'm smarter than you about this because my pastor just talked about this what i want our church to do as individuals is not just say well let me go ask my pastor let me go ask you know our staff or let me let me uh you know go ask somebody else i want us to be able to give a reasoned response of why we, we believe this way. Why do we think this? Not just because, well, this is what I've always been told. That's not a really great defense or a reason why to do something. And, and by the way, there are things that when I grew up, in, in just my own personal experience, that where, where I grew up and in the, the religious environment that I grew up in, what I was told and taught wasn't true. 
And so if I just said, well, that's what I've always been taught, and I continue to believe that way without searching God's Word for the correct answer, then you understand I would be in error. And we don't want to be in error. Uh, we, we want to have the truth expose the errors that might be in our, in our heart and in our life. And so that's what Peter is saying here. Look again at verse number 14. Here's the reason why we need to give a response. But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And notice, and, and we made mention a couple weeks ago, this is a good phrase to underline. And be not afraid of their terror. Because they're going to try to intimidate you with questions. And, and they're going to try to sound like they're smarter or, or they have more knowledge or they're more well-read or any of those kind of things. And Peter says very bluntly, don't be afraid of them. Don't, don't, don't fear that. Neither be troubled, he says in verse number 14. And so we want to, again, give answers for why it is we're, we're believing the way that we do. I think questions are powerful things. And by the way, when you look through the New Testament, especially the Gospels, and we made mention of this, how did Jesus oftentimes answer his critics was by asking questions. And so we'll talk a little bit about that tonight and what do questions do when we ask questions? Why is that a, a good way to kind of approach some of these things? And I think questions get us to think. Questions are not uh, accusatory necessarily. Questions start to get my conscience involved rather than just um, accusing somebody of, well, you just, you're a moron, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, if I start to get in an argument, that's the tone that I start to take. Right? I don't want to get in an argument. Arguments often, and, you know, if you have an argument with your significant other, your spouse, <laughs> usually there's not a lot of thinking going on. There's just defense of my way, my, my position. Rather than reasoning out, here's why I'm doing this. Here's why I think this way. And I'm doing that in a more peaceful manner. And I think that fosters the conversation much more than just starting to fight and bicker and yell at each other. Okay, um, what does the Bible say? Uh, Solomon said, a soft answer turneth away what? Wrath. So if someone is, is coming at me with some accusations or railing it on me or, or starting to, um, you know, make fun or accuse me because of my faith, well, the best way for me to respond to that is not, oh yeah, well, sticks and stones. It's, it's not a harsh answer back. It's a soft answer to turn away wrath. It's, it's thinking through and reasoning through with that person why you do what you do and asking them, why do you do what you do? Why do you believe in the way that you do? And so I think we'll just kind of do some review and get to where we left off last, or a couple weeks ago, I should say. But number one, the first thought that we, we mentioned was this, apologetics, or that reasoned defense of, of our beliefs. Apologetics begins with understanding the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Notice what Peter says in verse number 15, all right? But sanctify who? The Lord God in your hearts. So the reason is not so that I will look smarter or that I, ooh, I had a good answer to that one. Praise the Lord. I, you know, hey, I feel better about myself. The issue is I want the Lord Jesus Christ to get glory in all these things, all right? And so in my answers, I need to start with sanctifying the Lord God in my hearts. And if I'll sanctify the Lord in my heart, if I will sincerely have Him, uh, talking about our adult Sunday school class curriculum, if I'll have Him in my thoughts regularly, all right, I'll, have, I'll desire godliness in my life, then I'm much more likely to give a good, well-thought-out answer, a reasoned response, rather than an attacking response. All right? And so it begins with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If I speak truth but I do it in the wrong way, I'm going to shut the door uh, to, to witness to that person. I'm going to destroy the opportunity God might be bringing in my path. Right? Um, does, does pride quench the Holy Spirit and His work in my life? Yes. Yes. Again, we quote this, seems like, every Sunday. Um, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Right? So if I approach this from a humble perspective, then I'm not quenching the Holy Spirit. By the way, what did Jesus say in John 14, 15, and 16? I'm going to send you another comforter, and He will give you what? The words to even speak. So that when you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit will be able to bring things to your remembrance. That's one reason why we talk about Scripture memorization, is when I get into that position and I'm thinking through, what do I, how can I say this? The Holy Spirit can work, but He can't work if I'm quenching Him through my pride. Right? So I want the Holy Spirit to have full and free reign. Speaking right things in a wrong attitude or in a wrong spirit 
accomplishes destruction, but speaking right things in a right spirit can accomplish things that only God can do. By the way, look at verse number 16. Look at the very first phrase in verse number 16. Having a good, what? Conscience. So I don't get done with the conversation and say, ah, I wish I wouldn't approach it that way. I wish I wouldn't have said it that way or in that tone or in that manner. I don't want to regret the conversation. I want to look back and say, praise the Lord for what he did in that conversation. I want to have a good conscience about how I approach that. All right? So apologetics, number one, begins with the Lordship of Christ. Secondly, apologetics, defending my faith, apologetics serves the ultimate purpose of evangelism. Does everyone have faith in something? Yes. Does everyone have a religion, so to speak? Yes. Yes. Believe it or not, atheism is a religion. And most of the proponents of atheism that you'll come in contact with are pretty vocal about their religion. All right? And so just understand that when someone comes to you and says, well, you're just, you know, you just have that blind faith, whereas I, you know, I'm from the point of education. No, you're putting your faith in what somebody else said. You're, you're putting your faith in what maybe Darwin or Huxley or some of these other philosophers have said, rather than where I place my faith is in God Almighty. Right? Everyone has faith. Everyone has a religion. The ultimate reason why we might engage in this is found again in verse number 15. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, notice, a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The goal of this is so that I might be a testimony. I might get the gospel to that person. All right? Help them to, we use this phrase, help them to doubt their doubts. Ask questions to them. For example, uh, there is no absolute truth. We brought this out again. There, there is no absolute truth. That is an absolute statement. And what that person has just asked you to do is not believe what, they've, what they're saying. If you, if you carry that out to its logical conclusion. All right? And I, I get told that fairly regularly. Well, there is no absolute truth. You can't just stand on one thing. Well, who says you're the authority? Right? It, what you're saying is an absolute truth in and of itself. The ultimate goal, bring them to faith in Christ. Get them to doubt the things that they believe in. H help them to understand that their reasoning is, is skewed. Right? It's not coming from a, a proper perspective. So I want to talk now about these questions. Right? And we, we started this last week and we'll get through these tonight. Number one, why do we ask questions in this mode of apologetics or in, in the mode of defending our faith, number one, a question forces people to open up about general assumptions they might have. Question, have you ever assumed anything? I have. And it gets you in trouble. All right? Um, I remember many times just making an assumption and it was wrong because I only came from, again, one side of the story or one perspective. And if I only come from my side of the story, well, I'm not getting what the other perspective might be, all right? Uh, if I want to fight with my wife, well, what perspective am I going to come from? I'm going to come from my perspective, and my perspective is right. And I'm going to tell her how right it is. Well, I mean, she's a tremendous lady, but she's going to come from her, her perspective too. <laughs> and she's going to say her way is right. Right? So if we don't come together and kind of reason some of this stuff out, we, we, we make assumptions that are not true. And questions get people to open up a little bit about general assumptions. All right. Now, take your Bible again to, to the uh, book of Luke. And we'll get to Matthew here in just a second. Look at Luke, and I want you to, to show you just an example here of a general assumption, how Jesus uh, faced a general assumption that was made. Luke chapter number 18. Luke 18 is the story, beginning in verse number 18, is the story of the, the rich young ruler. All right, you remember the rich young ruler comes to, to Jesus and he asks him, saying, verse 18, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what does Jesus say? He asks him a question. Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. What has Jesus just tried to get this man to understand? You've just called me God. So I want you to come from that perspective, understanding you're asking God this question. And if you're asking God the question, then the right answer is going to be coming. You have to be accepting of what the answer is. 
Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. So what commandment is that that we're, asking, that we're talking about that Jesus just mentioned in verse number 22? Anybody know? Number one. Let's start at number one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What's the response of the rich young ruler? Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Why? Because money or possessions was his God. And so what Jesus has done by asking a question is he has exposed this man's assumptions that I'm a good person. If anybody deserves heaven, it's me. But what Jesus says is you can't even get past the number one commandment. You need to think about who you are and, and what you are deep down in your heart. All right? And so that's what questions do. By the way, will some people automatically have an opinion of you because you're a Christian? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Say it again. Uh, yes. <laughs> they will automatically assume a lot of things about you because you're Christian. Uh, you're against them. You're against everything that they do. You can't stand anything they do. And the only people that you like are Christian people. I mean, that's some assumptions that people make. Well, questions can help to open up some of that. All right? Number two. Questions cause people to open up with not just their, 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 their general uh, assumptions, but how about cultural assumptions? You remember the story we talked about in Matthew chapter number 22, where the, the Pharisees come to him asking him about uh, the coin. Should we pay taxes or not? Well, whose coin is it? Well, that's Caesar's coin. Well, then give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Right? They assume because they're Jews and because this man was claiming to be the Messiah, that culturally he's going to tell them either one, you don't have to pay taxes, which is revolting against Rome, or two, yes, you have to pay taxes and you can't be the Messiah because you must not be for the Jews. Right? And Jesus exposes their cultural assumptions. All right? Now, let's move on to number three, and here's where we, we left off last week. Number three, asking questions ex exposes faulty logic. Now, Turn to Matthew chapter 22 again. Matthew 22, asking questions exposes the faulty logic that can come about. Matthew 22, look at verse number 23. Matthew 22, verse 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, and the Bible gives us some, some commentary here. The Sadducees, are, they would say that there is no resurrection. Right? So they don't believe in any kind of resurrection. And here's what they ask Jesus, saying, Master, Moses said if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were uh, with us seven brethren, and, and they go into this whole lengthy explanation, this, this ridiculous scenario where there's they, this wife goes through seven brothers and none of them raise up children. And so the, the question comes down to, verse number 28, therefore in the what? In the resurrection. Do you understand they don't believe in the resurrection? Yet they're asking, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? In other words, they're trying to trip him up. If there is a resurrection, which we don't believe that there is, but how, can, how are you going to justify whose wife this woman is in the resurrection? Well, Jesus really kind of exposes them. Verse number 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And he begins to expose faulty logic that these, have, these people have. If I start with a bad premise, I'm going to end up with a bad conclusion. Right? Uh, it's the same thing that we would say about, um, well, you have faith and I don't. Uh, I have reason or education. That, that's faulty logic. Everyone believes something. Right? And so if I have bad logic, I'm going to come to a wrong conclusion. By the way, uh, can an atheist prove that God does not exist? No. Can I prove that God exists? That is scientific proof. Not necessarily. I take that on faith. Now, I think we can point to all of creation. I think we can point to reason in our universe. And there are a lot of things that we can point to. But for an atheist person that's just looking for one example of how I can prove God, I'm never really going to be able to do that because they're not coming from a faith perspective. 
right? I have to come from the idea that you can't prove it either, neither can I. We both have faith in something, right? We, we both exercise belief in something or what somebody has said. And so all that that does, when I assume that, I'm presuming that my intelligence is greater. My knowledge of something is greater than another person's, right? And that is not, not necessarily true. Okay, so how about the person that says, there is no moral objective standard. There is no standard of right and wrong. There is no, uh, morality is not a, a spiritual thing or it did not come from Almighty God. That came from just within us or somewhere else. Okay, can I just, let, let's think through it. What if that person who believes that, that there is no moral standard, what if that person gets robbed? What if someone in their family, heaven forbid, gets murdered? Do you think that person wants justice? What if, what if somebody went into their bank account and took all of their money? What do you think they're going to do? They're going to freak out. And they're going to want their money back. They, they want justice. I want to find out who did this. But if there is no moral standard, if there's no, no source of where morality comes from, then what does it matter what we do to somebody else? I have full and free reign and right to take whatever you have that I want if there's no morality. Right? So the person that says there is no moral standard, let them have their money taken. Let them have a family member's life taken and suddenly there becomes a moral standard. You understand? Suddenly they, they want justice. And often the atheist person will, will point to things like injustices that happen in the world. Well, a, a loving God would never allow this to happen. A love, I've heard this several times. A loving God would never allow terrorists to get on an airplane and crash into the World Trade Center. A loving God would never do that. To which my response is, well, what does it matter if there's no morality? What, what does it matter? See, I can't have a God that is altogether loving as you say that He is. By the way, is God love? Yes, we read that in, on Sunday night. God is love. But I can't have a loving God without a God that also meets out perfect justice. All right? Because if He really loved, then He would ultimately be the judge and the justifier. He would be the one who merits what justice is. All right? So if I, if I have a God that I say loves, well, what about the person who is wronged or the person who's homeless or the person that, that can't pay their bills? Well, how, how does God love that person? Well, God, if there is no God, then He is not love. He, he is not justice. Right? You can't have one or the other. Right? If I have a God and you say that He's only loving, He has to be just at the very same time right? in order to mete out His love. Where does it, by the way... Where does a moral standard come from? We would say it comes from God. It comes from His Word. But the atheist, who, where does the atheist believe that you and I came from? Yes, the rock or the tree or the fish or wherever else, right? We evolved from something. What is the, the base uh, standard of evolution? What, what was Darwin's theory? Well, it's survival of the fittest, right? And so if evolution is true, then you understand there's no room for a moral standard in evolution. Because if I'm trying to get my way to the top of the food chain, I don't care who's in my way. I'm not going to evolve into a moral standard. Right? Are we together or are we just, we're like, wow, I don't know what you're talking about, but you know, you're making a good case, I guess. Think, I want you to think with me about this stuff. And, and understand the way often to answer some of these people is not by thinking, well, I'm not smart enough to do that. No, you are smart enough to come to a logical conclusion that you cannot have these perspectives. You cannot give an answer, as Peter was saying, apart from just simple logically thinking through a position. And that's what questions do, is they begin, begin to expose faulty beliefs or faulty premises that, that somebody who is attacking you will have. Right? All right, let's move on, because I get the feeling we're bogging down here a little bit. Number four, asking questions then exposes the motive of people, all right? Uh, you're in Matthew 22. Look back a page or so, Matthew 21. Look at verse 23. 
And by the way, Matthew 21, 22, and 23 are just, it's just constant. Jesus is being challenged and people are coming to him. And in 21, 22, and 23, it's all kinds of Jesus just answering critics, answering those who are, who are against him, who want to falsely accuse him. He's just answering, answering, answering. It's just, it's, they're tremendous passages of scripture. Matthew 21, verse number 23. When he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? What are they doing? We want to know who sent you. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men. And notice what's going on inside of these false accusers, these Pharisees and chief priests. Notice what's going on. And they reason within themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And so here was their response. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. What had Jesus done? He just exposed their motive. And he got them to see, why are you asking this? You're, all that you're doing is you're blinded by your own jealousy. And they couldn't answer. And so what does he say? Then I'm not going to answer your question. I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to fall into your trap. Asking questions exposes motive. By the way, do people want to try to trip you and I up? Yeah, all the time. Because they think that if I best them in a question, then my way must be right. And again, I'll take you back to 1 Peter chapter number 3. Don't be afraid of them. Don't, don't, don't fear that. You, you understand who you believe. Now, do we all have all the answers? No. No. By the way, does the Bible include every answer to every question? No. No. But what I can do is I can learn all that I can and try to reason with somebody about why I believe what I believe. All right, number five, asking questions. Again, we're, we're dealing with this issue of apologetics. What about the method of asking questions? Asking questions exposes contradictions. All right, now, Matthew 22, back to Matthew 22 again. Look at verse number 41. Matthew 22, verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Now, the, the word Christ there is Messiah or anointed one. All right, So he's asking, who is the Messiah? Who, who do you think that he is? And they say unto him, the son of David. By the way, is that a right response? Yes, yes. We talked in, in the book of Matthew, earlier in the book of Matthew on Sunday morning, how that is a proper title for Jesus. All right, The son of David. You remember the two blind men who were going after Jesus? Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Does anybody remember anything we talk about here? Okay, good. A couple of you do. Good. So, yes, that's a proper response. He saith unto them, how then, you, you've answered right, but how then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on, thy, on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? What Jesus does is he takes them back to Psalm 110. And he says, okay, if you say that the Messiah, the, the Christ, is the son of David, you're right in saying that. Here's what the Old Testament says. The idea that, could, that the Pharisee and the scribe couldn't get past is they thought God is going to send a Messiah. He's going to send somebody to deliver us from, from the boot of Rome on our neck. He's going to eradicate Rome and, and, and their rule over us, and we're going to rule and reign with Him. They ne it never entered their mind that God Himself would be the one who is sent. They thought it was just going to be some man. And so for them to come and ask this question, what God is doing is He's exposing the contradiction in their own belief system of what does the Scripture say? God is going to send Himself. What did Abraham say? Son, God will provide Himself a lamb. Not just provide for Himself, He will actually provide Himself to be the Lamb of God. That's what John would say. Behold, the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. And so Jesus, by asking this question, again, is just exposing the contradictions that they did not understand in their 
reasoning through the Old Testament scriptures. So when someone says, okay, um, there's, there's no such thing as truth. And by the way, some, some people will say that. There's no such thing as truth. You know what they're asking you to do? Not believe them. Because what they're saying is, but, it, but what I'm saying is true. There's no such thing as truth, but what I just said is true. You can't have it again. You can't have it both ways. Okay? And so they're asking you not to believe them. Help them to see the contradictions in their perspective. Number six, asking questions ensures a conversation. What's the ultimate goal? To share the gospel with that person. Right? If I come from a mean spirit or an argumentative spirit, I'm going to shut the door to, to the grace that God wants to show in their life. But if I get a conversation going, we can talk through some of these things, and I can bring it now again back to Jesus Christ, back to the gospel. Right? I want the conversation. Seven, asking questions makes people, now this is, a, I know it's a bad word, makes people think. Right? And we don't like to think. See, we oftentimes think of outreach um, as like a, a Saturday visitation. We oftentimes think of outreach as just, well, when the church goes, that's when I will go. Or, or I need to get some gospel tracts so I can go out and, and go on visitation. But I don't see Jesus or the disciples doing that. You know what I do see them doing? Engaging in the people and the culture around them. That they're going out to the people that they come in contact with, and what are they doing? They're engaging them in a gospel conversation. Right? Um, I had the question asked me this week, not by someone here, um, someone outside the church, in fact, uh, another pastor, and the question was this, and it just got me to think. Are church services for evangelism? That's a good question. Are church services for evangelism? Or is the church supposed to be doing the evangelizing out there? Is the church service for the building up of the saints, for the teaching of the work of the ministry? Do you understand how we have come from a certain culture that says this is the way that we do church, and if we don't, you know, we, we can only bring people to church so that they can be saved, well, what about you conversing with that person on Tuesday? Why don't we reach people outside of the doors of this church and then bring them here to have them built up and discipled? See, sometimes I, I get concerned that we're, we're, we're backwards on some of this. Now, do we include the gospel presentation in our sermons and in our church presentation? Uh, you better believe that we do. By the way, every page of that book is the gospel. Right? And so it's easy to get back to Christ died, was buried, rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. All right? And because of that, He gives victory, He gives help, He gives strength, He gives uh, help, all of those things. So yes, we, we include the gospel, but is that our sole soul reason for being, well, Jesus made disciples. Right? And part of that is seeing them trust Christ, yes. Sharing the gospel, yes. And then teaching them, helping them, uh, seeing them grow and develop. Right? Uh, if we have a bunch of soul winners, great. That should also mean we have a bunch of disciples who are following up with those, those people who have just come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. All right? So let's think about this. And please don't take it where I'm not taking it. I am not saying, well, see, we're, we shouldn't be evangelizing in church. That is not what I'm saying. We should be doing that. All right? But part of what we also should be doing is teaching people and helping them to be discipled and grow. Some people, I'm telling you, some people who have been saved for five years, ten years, twenty years are so shallow in their belief that they don't know how to think through some of these things. They don't know how to properly interpret their Bible because they just, well, I mean, you know, we're supposed to be soul winners. I know that. And we stop there rather than teaching people, what does the Bible say about some of these things? How, can I ask a question about that? I, I, I had this question asked to me. How do I respond to that? Well, God has answers, I'm, I'm, I can tell you, in His Word. He wants us to be able to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Okay, so... This, this verse, back to 1 Peter in chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. If you're living a distinctive, not a pharisaical life, if you're living a distinctive Christian life, not, again, not just behavior, but inside of you, people are going to ask you, tell me about the hope that's in you. Why do you respond to things differently? Remember, the context of verse number 15 in 1 Peter chapter number 3, the context of giving an answer is what? Verse 14. 
Well, what's verse 14? But and if ye, what's the word? Suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. So the context of giving an answer is during persecution, during scorning, during uh, 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 when, when you're, you're going through a difficult time, when, when you're being mocked for your faith. That's the time when people are going to ask you, how come you respond in that way? How come you don't just get angry and lash back out at them? How come you're so, you're, you're so solid in what you believe? What is it? And people will ask that question if I'm living a genuine and a distinctive Christian life. Again, not as a Pharisee, but I'm living Christ every day. And so apologetics is logically explaining the gospel. Verse 15, a reason of the hope that is in you. Question, can your faith be reasoned through with, with, with your mind? Can, can you reason through why did you get saved? And remember, we asked, we asked this a couple weeks ago, and I, I want you to think sincerely about this. When somebody asks you, why are you saved? Don't give them how you got saved. That's not what they asked. They asked, why did you get saved? What was it that caused you to take the, 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 the belief system that you were in or turning from your sin? What caused you to turn and turn to Christ? By the way, when you do that, that's, being, that's thinking apologetically. Right? That's giving answer for the, hope, the reason for the hope that's in you. Right? And if you have never done that, if you've never done that, I would encourage you to write out your testimony. Just do a paragraph. Write out your testimony. It'll be one of the best witnessing tools you ever use. Is here's why I trusted Christ. Right? I realized this. I realized who I was. I realized who Jesus was. I mean, just go through it. Why did I do that? Not how, but why did I do that? We, we give the verses. Well, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Yeah, but what about in, in your life? Well, what was it? All right, so, so think through that. Be able to, to reason out those things in your own mind, in your own, in your own life. Uh, number five. We're going to finish these Apologetics gives reasons that lead to, verse 15, that lead to hope. A reason of the hope. Every religious system, every system in our world that denies God leads to hopelessness. Everyone. Christ is the reason for my hope. Right? So I'll, again, put your thinking cap on here. We're almost done. You can remove, I want you to think about the world's religions. You can remove the founder of any religion from the beginning of that, that religion. You can remove the founder and you could still have the promises or the, the premises, I guess I would say, on which the religion stands. Right? If I took Joseph Smith out of Mormonism, I could still have the basic premises of Mormonism. Right? It could just be somebody else who came up with the idea to have you know, kooky glasses and read golden tablets. All right? I could take um, Buddha out of Buddhism and I could still have the basic tenets of Buddhism. All right? Um, which to me makes absolutely no sense, but that's a whole other set of sermon series. All right? Um, the, the idea of Buddhism is to, to have no wants. So my one want is so that I don't have any wants. Anybody see any problem there? Yeah, that's a problem. All right? Um, and then I just cease to exist when I don't have any more wants, but that's what I want. It's never going to happen. It just leads to hopelessness. Right? Okay, so now think about Christianity. If I take Christ out of Christianity, could I come up with the basic tenets of Christianity? No. He is it. He, he is what I place my faith in. Without Him, there is nothing there. Right? I have no hope outside of Jesus Christ. And again, the end goal is not to win the argument with these kind of things. It's the, the issue to, to help people to see that Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the one that gives hope. That's why I want to give an answer is because I want to share with you, I have hope in me. And even though the world is falling apart and, and a family in Kentucky can lose three of their kids that God has given to them, they can have a hope. Here's why I still have hope in, in what God is doing in my life. Because of what Jesus Christ has done in me. I will see my kids again. Praise the Lord. Amen.
But I can't do that with any other faith, with any other religion. I have to work to get there. And then, and then it just is a, well, I hope I did enough. It's hopeless. But apologetics, what Peter is saying here, apologetics, number six, requires gentleness, respect, and again, verse 16, a good conscience. I'm not being proud. I'm not trusting in self. I'm not uh, letting my attitude crowd out the message of the gospel. Right? I'm not trying to get one over on somebody else. Again, you will not have the answer to everything. Right? You, you just won't. By the way, the Bible doesn't answer everything. But the questions that we don't have answers to, the person who's challenging you doesn't have answers to either. They, they can't answer how the world started. Number one, they weren't there. Neither were the people that they believe in what they're saying. I put my trust in what God has said because he was there. Right? He's the one that made this whole thing. And to say it came from a big bang out of nothing, do you understand that that logic is pointing back to God? God made this world out of nothing. So even human logic comes back to God. Right? It all points back. Everything in the universe is pointing back to God. So we're trying to get those people to understand, yeah, but you have faith, you're just putting your faith in something else. I put my faith in God who gives answers to these kind of things. We have more reliable answers, but we don't have to fake it. We don't have to get mad about it. We can reason with somebody else to give a reason for the hope that why we have done what we've done. Right? And that's why we're doing a series like this is to bring up some of these questions and say, okay, how do I answer this? What does the Bible say? Help me to think through this. Well, that's what we want to do. I believe this is part of discipleship is going through what does the Bible say about this, about this topic or about this issue. All right? And so we'll go through some of those things. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you all as well are as well. And I hope it's a help to you. Again, not to think, well, he has all the answers or we're, you know, we're the most knowledgeable church. No, that's not our goal. All right? By the way, we're not. And I'm not. But we can look in our Bible and, and hopefully get some answers for the hope.